Hello everyone. Thank you for joining me today on Create with Chris. Today we're going to be talking about our favorite painting techniques, floating, shading, highlighting. Here today with me is Lindsay. She's going to be manning all the questions. So be sure to pop in and say hi. Let us know where you're from. And if you have any questions, just put them in the comments and Lindsay will get back to you. Um, shading and highlighting, and that's probably the one painting technique that is most talked about and the most struggled with. I think it's a very simple process. It's a big part of mindset. What is shading and highlighting and floating? This is what paint is, um, how you use paint to add dimension, interest, and creates really impressive results. And I think everybody knows before you add the shading and the highlighting, it just looks like a plain flat painting. Um, again, it's also dubbed as floating or blending. And there's many ways to create shadows and highlights. I thought today I would share with you just some of my favorites and things that I have picked up over the years that have just made my life just a little bit easier when it comes to shading and highlighting. I encourage you to experiment, to play, and to find out what method works best for you. And I've taught all over the country, and it always amazes me at how many different types and styles that are used for shading and highlighting. So not any one particular method is, can be the best method. It's whatever works best for you. And again, if you practice and play, really encourage you to try new things. Um, I'm, I'm going to tell a little story about Priscilla Hauser because she changed my life and I'm sure she's changed many lives, but we were at a convention and we were right next to Priscilla and I could hear her talking um, to the painters and she is, she's, she's just a wonderful painter and everything she says, I just hang on to her every word because She's really good and she does know what she's talking about. And, and she'd say, there are as many ways to paint as there are temperatures in your oven. And she said, you just have to find the right way that works for you and practice, practice, practice. And after sitting, hearing her at the convention, I came back and I, I looked at the way I was painting and I'll share some of the different things that, that she brought to my attention, changed my life and changed the way my painting looks. And it took the stress out of it. You know, I, I play around and I'm thinking, oh, if that's difficult, there has to be a better way. And so this is what we're gonna go with through today. Try to take that stress out of shading and highlighting, make it fun. I love to shade and highlight. It's almost magical what it does to um, your painting and how it elevates it and creates that professional, almost kind of a wow factor. Um, important key elements to creating perfect shading and highlighting. Brushes. You want to flip it down, Lindsay, and brushes. Oh my goodness. If you do not have good brushes, you are not going to get good results. So your brush has to have nice form. You have to have a nice chisel edge and it doesn't matter if it's a filbert, if it's an angle, or if it's a flat. All of these can be used for shading, but they have to be good brushes. Nice sharp chisel edge. You know those brushes that kind of um, flare out over the years with a little bit of use and abuse? don't use those for your shading and highlighting. You, if they look a mess, you're going to have re a really um, struggle on your hands trying to get a good look out of shading and highlighting. So make sure that your brushes are good brushes. Um, it's as with anything, your results are only good as going to be as good as your tools. And if they're not looking good, you're not going to get really good results. Acrylic paint, I use DecoArt acrylic paint. Um, it's very opaque, very pigmented. It has nice saturation. Some of the uh, craft paints on the market are a little less pigmented 
and may require more application. So if you're painting with a good paint, you're probably going to get better results. Clean water. Make sure that the water you use is not muddy because you can't get a nice clean float if your um, water is all muddy. You'll, you'll, it'll tint your paint and you'll see that on the end results. Smooth surface. And I do use multi-purpose sealer before I paint. It's going, it does several things. It seals your surface, makes sure the paint adheres well. And then I lightly sand it with a real low grit sandpaper. It's going to give me a super smooth surface, which is going to do a multitude of things. Number one, it's going to make shading and highlighting so much easier for your brush to flow across and get a nice smooth float. Also, it's going to be easier on your bristles because they're not going to wear down with that green that's on the surface. So I always just take a minute to um, seal my surface, lightly sand it, and then I know I've got a, a good base coat, a good base to build on. All right. Probably most important with shading and floating is your mindset. You want to be in charge. You want to be fearless and you want to paint with confidence. So keep that in mind. Don't be afraid. These brushes are designed to do amazing things. You just kind of have to use the steering wheel to make them work. So jump in there and don't worry about how it's going to look. And anything can be fixed. And if it doesn't look good in the end, we have sandpaper, we could try it again. But again, practice, practice. It's going to make a big, big difference. Loading the brush. There are several different ways to load the brush, and I'm just going to squirt out just a little bit of paint here. I thought I'd zip through some of the terminology and some of the process of floating and shading, and then we're going to do a little quick project. I like to use an angle brush. You can use about anything to float and shade with. Um, and I'm just going to load the toe of my brush. I have a little bit of water in my brush, but it's not drippy wet. And I'm just kind of floating it over my palette. And I usually, when I uh, work the paint into my brush, always make sure it stay, it doesn't go any further than halfway. And then you can just float that out. Now my brush was dragging just a little bit. So that means I don't have enough water. So I can get just a touch more water. After I get water on my brush, I usually just lay it on a paper towel to draw out some of the excess. Water is such a key factor. And then I can go over and over and over. Because my paint is moist enough, fluid enough, I can go over it many times before it starts to tack out. I can pull it out. I can walk it over. I can change the shape of it. The paint has to be fluid enough to be able to move. See this line over here that I'm starting to form? That means the color has transitioned clear across the edge of my bristles. And I'm just going to clean my brush and go over that. And I can soften that down and watch it disappear. And once your paint starts to dry, you can no longer work with it. Just let it dry, and then you can go back and add more paint to that. I can do a double load, which means I'm going to put color on both sides of my brush, work it in a little bit, and then I get that transition from light to dark very easily. I can do that with an angle. I can do the same thing with a um, filbert. I can do nice shading with the filbert. I can double load my filbert. I'm just going to go back in that same place. It's already blended, and I can pull out a really nice flower petal. Shading and highlighting is pretty much there. Just need to go back and ramp it up a little bit. Same thing with a flat. I'm going to just load the corner of it, pull it down. I've got a nice edge on that, and I can reshape it. 
I can go around anywhere I want as, and move the paint around as long as I want. I can go in and double load. And I can pull out and have a two-tone stroke on that. That's kind of just a little quick um, run through of how to load the brush, single load versus double load. You never want to overload your brush. If you get too much paint, you're going to get what's called a saddlebag on both sides. And I don't think it'll show up on camera, but I've got a roll down this side and a roll down that side. Too much paint. Always work it out on the palette so that there's paint in the brush. And I've really loaded my brush up. There's paint, but it's nice. I have that chisel edge. I can just really float that on there. Go back and work with it, move it around. Don't be afraid. This is really a easy way to apply paint. A little bit of a, you know what that is, a UFO in there. And then I can just go back and clean that up because my paint is still fluid enough. Don't let that paint travel across the tip of the brush. Just keep, I like to keep that, um, this end of the brush just a little bit clean. And then if I have a, a problem, I can go over and use that clean edge to just straighten it up. You can move it around. I think what I've seen after teaching all these years is people are, uh, painters are kind of afraid of floating and highlighting, floating and shading. It just seems a little bit intimidating. But the thing is, if it looks a little bit rough, that's just the first coat. Let that paint work for you. Let that be very fluid and movable. Um, we had a question. Do you prefer white or gray palette paper? I think if I did more realistic style paintings where color was such an integral part of the design, I would prefer gray because you can really see all, all colors much more um, true. True. Thank you. With, with white, everything is like bounced off of white and it's, it's much more um, sharp or it's brighter with gray, you see the true color just a little bit more. So I, I think it's just a matter of personal preference. Okay, so now we know how to load the brush. I'm gonna share with you how to hold the brush. I kind of prefer an angle. I just, I've always used an angle to float with. It's comfortable for me. Um, so I, I just, that's my go-to brush. I've seen absolutely beautiful painters using flats. I'm a little bit envious because it, a flat is a little awkward for me. So again, use what is comfortable for you. When the brush is loaded, just going to get a little more paint on my brush. When the brush is applied to the surface, make sure that all of the bristles not just the toe of the brush, but all of the bristles, that little thing again, all of the bristles are flat on the surface. If you just use the toe of the brush, you're gonna get a straight line. If you just use part of the brush, it's not going to float out. I like to use the whole brush, just really put it down and I can go for a long way just with that float and I can do a smooth float. I can pull it out, pull it out, pull it out. And he says basics are so important. Basics are very important. And I think the key to floating and shading easily is being comfortable with the way your brush is loaded, being comfortable with the way that you hold the brush. So when you're applying paint, whether it's a single load or a double load, and I'm just going to double load here, just be easier. Look at how the brush is in your hand. 
the angle has the angle to it. And I think that's comfortable for me because that's how I hold a pencil. So it makes it easier. When I lay it down, I'm not just on the chisel edge. I'm kind of on the flat of the back. And I can pull it out and pull it out and pull it out. And I can really float for a long time. That brush has a lot of bristles on it. You should be able to float a nice long time before you have to reload or your brush is not loaded correctly. You want to be able to have controlled strokes, but they also need to be very loose and almost um, kind of free spirited. In addition to how the brush is loaded and how the brush is held, you need to know how much water to put on the brush. And I think that's probably, I should have started with that one. If the brush is too wet, the paint is going to puddle out. If your brush is too dry, you're not going to be able to float very far. And I've, I've seen painters that, that go like, an inch and then they have to reload and they go try to blend it in. Okay, you're stopping and starting and stopping and starting because you don't have enough moisture in your brush to flow that paint. So if your brush is loaded correctly and you have enough moisture in your brush, I should be able, I'm gonna go around the outer edge. I should be able to really Put a nice float on this for a long way before I have to reload. And I do use both sides of my brush. Lori says, I have trouble with angles. She forgets to put the entire brush down. And I think then if you have trouble with an angle, unless you practice with it and become comfortable with it, stick to a flap. Um, and practice with an angle. I love my angle because I, it's just very comfortable for me. And actually, when Jen and I paint, we pretty much only use angles. That's what we're comfortable with. And don't you think a big part of it is what you learn on? You know, if you've always used a, a flat to shade with, you're always going to be more comfortable. Watching, yeah. So she can learn. I like to kind of pull my brush along, but I have painted all the way around. I think I've done, I've reloaded my brush three times. My paint is still very wet. I have enough moisture in my brush to really pull that paint around so that when I go to where I started, I can blend it in. It's not dry yet. So I can really blend that all in very quickly. Now, this is not my final float. So if I want more shading on it, I'll let it dry and add more. But this is a really good way to get that first coat. It's almost like base coating. When you base coat, that first coat's kind of awful. The second coat's starting to look better. And sometimes you might even need a third coat. No different than shading. Sometimes the first coat is a little bit weak. The second coat is going to build that up. It's going to look a lot better. So don't try to get perfection on the first float. Just think about base coating. It's not much different. Now, I know in some areas, Ohio's not bad, but in some areas it's very arid and it's um, really hard to get a nice long float if your paint's going to dry up before you get a chance to float that out. You may need to mist your surface or just very, very lightly kind of put a little bit of moisture on there. That's going to give you more open time when you're floating. It just helps the paint to slide on a little bit smoother, a little bit quicker. So, you may need to add a little bit of moisture. I love my Distress Sprayer. This little mister is um, different than a spray bottle. When you spray with a spray bottle, it kind of goes 
and you get this big flow of, of water. When you spray with the mister, it just goes and you get this nice little soft mist. Lindsay's laughing at me, but I love the little the mister. Sound yeah, I don't know if you can hear. It. Okay, everybody listen. You hear that little and it's covered the whole thing. It's just a soft little and that's all you need. You don't need the you just need the to get a little bit of water on there. Another really good agent in trans and in, in adding more open time is glazing medium. I really have kind of latched on to the fast dry glaze medium because I'm kind of an impatient painter. But if I'm working in a big area and I need more open time, this is great because it's going to allow that paint to be a little more fluid for a little more time. And it's going to give me that extra time I need to blend everything together. But with a lot of glazing mediums, you have to be patient because it does take a while to dry. With this, I can hit it with my um, dryer and it dries up very quickly. So this is just a um, short term open time agent. <laughs> Does that make sense? That was a lot of adjectives. It <laughs> is, but it's, it's really handy to work with because it does help that paint to flow on very, very easily and very smoothly. Okay, stroke work. We've talked about, um, where's my, I guess we'll just stick to this. There's different types of ways to add the shading. And I'm gonna get just a little more, let's go with a little more. All these different factors, and it, it sounds kind of confusing, but when you add them all together, it, it just really makes a simple way to add floating. Terry says she, she's in Colorado, which is a high desert area, very dry, open time is a real struggle. You know, I had a, a painter, I taught a class, and the gal said, oh my gosh, I didn't know. I knew how to float until I came to Ohio. But it is a huge factor, and if you, you don't realize how arid your area is, you may struggle with floating for years and not really know that it's not you. And, but there are things to help with that. So yes, that is a huge factor. All right, to shade. I'm just gonna pick up a little bit of a darker um, orange. And I can do long fluid strokes to get a nice smooth float. All right, that's just a nice fluid stroke uh, to shade. My favorite is my little um, tappy float, which I kind of pop it on there. And I just really work that paint around. I can go in and my paint's still very fluid. So I can go in and just really move that paint around. I like that bit of movement versus the soft, smooth float. That's just my style. But I would encourage you, whether you do a smooth float or you do my little tappy float, that you just really enjoy the process. And I can go back and add layer over layer. And that's just really going to fill in very, very nicely. In fact, let me just put a little heat to this. And we'll do just a little more. Every layer has to be completely dry before the next layer is added. And I tried to think I was above that, but it doesn't work. You really need to let it dry. Just going to add a little bit of a darker color to see what a difference layering. So we started with the yellow. We added a little bit of that orange. And now I'm going in. This is antique maroon. And I can go in and just really enhance that and work that paint in. And I'm still using
that same brush because I can move that around and just really work it in. And you can see how nicely that's blended. And if I see something I don't like, you know what? I'm not going to stress about it because guess what? I can go back and I can add some more after it dries. I think that's the biggest part of floating and shading is that we expect too much to happen too soon. And there's always that stage where it's not looking all that great. I can go in here and just, you see how quickly I'm working, moving that paint around. I don't have a lot of paint on my brush. My motto is a little bit of paint makes a big difference. If my paint does not move quickly, that means I do not have enough moisture on my brush. Look at what's happening. Look at how your brush is hitting the surface. Are all the bristles intact with the surface? Jen says you make it look so easy. Um, it is easy. I think what's stressful is thinking about it. It's like taking that test and after it's over with, you're going, oh my gosh, that wasn't so bad. Um, I think it's that knowing that you can go back and fix everything that it's not gonna look great right now, but that's okay, I can go back and I, I just have a lot of water on my brush to tease that paint around to where I want it to be. And I can go in and just really make that shading amazing. Um, Terry says, so the glaze medium would extend the fluidity? Gla yeah, the glaze medium will help um, it, it's almost like water on steroids. It's going to give you more open time. It's going to help transport the paint. It's going to um, thin it down just a little bit like the opaqueness. It'll make it a little more translucent, but it will, it has been a big big has made a big difference for many painters that struggle with, floating because it does seem to um, enhance the float ability. Um, Lisa is watching on YouTube says, I always have problems with shading around corners. The paint lifts off on one side. Okay. When I go around corners, okay, is this dry? I don't try to differentiate between this is one side or the other. So when I float the corner, I just take the toe of my brush and, and tuck it in. I don't do one corner and then go back and do the other corner because you will get that empty spot. I just take my brush and I do the whole corner and I kind of pull it out a little bit. Okay, can you see my brush strokes? I'm going to make some messy brush strokes here because I have a lot of water on my brush. Okay, can you see the messy brush strokes? All I have to do if you don't like those and you're fussing, looky there, that's the good old mop brush. Soften it down, make it perfect and smooth. Don't try to do it one time. Okay, so if you have struggles with the corner, go around it. All work that corner. Don't stop at the corner and start down the other side. Just make it one continuous, almost like a, like a square circle. Does that make sense? Just work it around that corner and blend it in. Do it several times to build it up. One time will not be enough. No different than base coating. Pull that paint around. This corner here looks kind of empty. I can go back. This is my second coat. I can pull that out. Look how it's starting to filter in and become very, very soft. I'm not a smooth uh, floater. You can go around and smooth it out. I have trouble with that. And you can mess with it until it starts to tack up. Then walk away, let it dry, and come back and soften it down, add another layer, blend it in. Don't make it so difficult. You want to work smoothly. You want to work quickly. 
You want to work fearlessly. And when I say quickly, I'll back up. Quickly does not mean you lose control. You still want to have good control when you float that paint in. Make sure I don't. So here I've got kind of a choppy edge. I can go back. Look how that starts to really glow with just that little bit of extra paint on there. Just going back to enhance. Now for this one, I might want it a little smoother. See how it just saw, all of a sudden it's just like really stands out. Same thing here, I can go down here. I can start over here and walk to the left. I've seen different ones walk to the left and walk to the right. Just remember to keep that other side of your brush clean if it is a single load. I can go back and really darken that up. See how easily you can add that on there. If it's not looking good, you can go back, let it dry, and go back and starting to get that ghost line on this opposite side means my brush is not clean. So I clean my brush, go back and remove that ghost line, and then I can resume my shading. And you should be able to shade that whole length very easily. If you have your brush loaded correctly, if you have your brush on the surface correctly, if you're holding it at the right angle correctly, and if you have enough moisture in your brush. Everything has to fall in place to make it super easy. Once you train yourself to look at your brush and make sure that it's everything's correct, then when you jump in to add your floating, your shading, it's going to really be an easy little brush stroke. It's just like the story of Goldilocks. You have too much paint, too much water. It's not going to work. Too little. It's not going to work. You just have to have it just right. And these techniques will work the same way um, for every project, whether it's whimsical or whether you're leaning more toward realistic painting. Good control of your brush. Good brushes. Good shape. Right amount of moisture and you should be able to move mountains with this. So I did this little, I'm gonna put this into practice. I did this little pumpkin. I thought it'd be fun to play around with it. I've been doing Halloween lately. I did. This is um, no tricks, just treats. It's a little breadboard I did. And if you wanna practice with shading and highlighting, this one's really good because it's not a difficult project at all. Just a lot of shading and highlighting. And it, it went. And I, it, I tell people, oh, it painted up so quickly. And they're going, yeah, right. Well, when you think about it, and we're going to do a little pumpkin, but when you think about it, it's just base coat and a few floats. And you've got everything ready to go. All you have to do is add the detail. Um, I just finished this one up yesterday this is another breadboard just one bite it's the little candy apple that is wickedly delicious that one is um it won't be online until tomorrow yeah we've i've got a working on getting that uploaded it will be available tomorrow okay i'm going to add this paint on here i have base coated this with marigold and I use my filbert. I love using a filbert to paint rounded shapes. And you can see I just go down this way and this way, and then I painted the center in. But I wanted you to see how messy, uh, messy is not the word. This is not opaque, how translucent this is. I don't worry about that because I know by the time I add my layers on, it's going to go from um, from this to looking fantastic. And I, I think we get too focused on each process instead of thinking about how it's going to come together at the end. 
So all I've done is put one coat of this marigold on, and this is Spice Pumpkin. I, You know, when they name something Spice Pumpkin, if you're painting a pumpkin, in my mind, I don't have a choice. I have to use that. So I'm loading my filbert, and I'm just going to take it and go boom. And that's all I do to base coat. It's not a big deal. So I boom, boom, boom with the marigold and then top coated it with the spice pumpkin. And I'll let that dry for just a second here. Is the stem and cobblestone? Um, the stem is fawn, but cobblestone would work well. And I'm usually not too fussy about a light tan color. I usually get something that's not too dark and not too light. And then it just makes a nice uh, medium uh, tone for the background. So I am going to grab my half inch angle. I like working with bigger brushes. I'm going to build my shading up. I am started with that Spice Pumpkin. And I'm just going to grab a little bit of, this is Red Spice. This is really a pretty color. My light source is from the top left. And I'm just going to load my brush, the toe of my angle. I could bump down to a quarter inch, but I like to be able to have nice, long, fluid strokes. So I'm going to just put this down that center valley grab a little more paint. I want to be able to pull that out a little bit. Okay. And I do blend on my piece a lot. So I want to make sure on my palette it's blended, but then I'll put it on here and kind of work it out. After I get the paint where I want it, I can float it out very easily. So I'm not making sure it's perfect on my palette, but when I put it on here, I can blend it out that way. And this one has kind of a wide divide in it, so I'm just working it until it blends out the way I want it. Just put a little bit more water in my brush. I'm going to go down this side. That's the way I want to do it, just quick and easy. Blend it out, grab a little more. And you notice these valleys are not perfect. I'm okay with that because this is not my final shade. Put a little bit down here. Now to do this side, I turn my brush kind of at an angle because I don't want it to fill that hole section in. Just going to take that clean part and clean it out a little bit. And I like just a teeny bit on the edge. I'm going to do the same thing. I'm just kind of using the toe of my brush to put that paint in there. Just a little bit. Let this dry. Very important. Let it dry. I've been doing a lot of Halloween lately. I'm not sure just on the agenda, I guess. These are the um, little pieces that I just finished up. I thought they were so cute. So these are Halloween book stack ornaments. And that's I'm kind of into pumpkins, I think, right now. So this is what we're going for with this. We're going to change that into that very quickly. Okay, we're, we're sort of dry. Going to go down with Antique Maroon. So I'm just bumping my shading colors down. Again, the bottom and the right side is going to be just a little bit stronger. A little bit of that. Because this is a stronger color, I'm going to be a little light-handed with it. So I can make sure that I'm getting what I want. Okay. Going to get just a little more paint because I want that bottom to be a little bit stronger. 
There we go. And I'm just going to grab, I'm doing just one side right now. It's like magic because it, it looks is. like the crevices are just starting to appear. I, I love doing, this is my favorite thing about painting. And I've heard painters say, oh, I hate that shading. And I'm going, oh my gosh, this is the coolest thing ever. Just like magic. Okay, we're going to pop this in here. This side's going to be a little bit stronger and darker. Got a little bit there. See, my paint's still very movable. So I can go back on this side and move that around a little bit. I'll put some over here. And I'm not being fussy. Just let that paint lay in there. We want this dark at the bottom. Just like that. It's really made a difference already. Now, if I decide after I dry this, I'm going, you know, I think I need more of a softer transition between the light and the dark. I can go back with a little bit of that red spice and I can add a little more of that gradation in there and blend that in. Lisa says, um, it's the base coats I don't like doing. The shading and details are fine. <laughs> yeah. I used to do a lot of sewing and I thought if I could just get somebody to cut the patterns out on the fabric and I could just sit down and sew that would be so much fun but I never had any volunteers for that okay let that dry just a bit oh next week won't be live but I have I think this is a piece that I I'm going to be, it'll be a free tutorial, and that will be on my Create with Chris channel on YouTube, and it's really a cool piece. It's uh, one, two, three, four pieces. It's a little stand, and I think you'll enjoy that. I used the lace stencil for the curtains. There's a little bit of lace on the base underneath the pumpkin pie. Really fun to paint up. Okay. That will go live March 5th. I want my pumpkin just a little bit darker, so I'm going to grab just a bit of black plum. And if you've never used black plum on orange, it is gorgeous. And I can go in here, and you can see it just really adds a nice glow. And I want this to be... Um, a little bit darker and a little bit stronger on this right side. So I can just really pop that in there. And you can see what a huge difference that makes. Really enhances that. And that was black plum? Black plum. If you've never used black plum, it's like my favorite Halloween color. It's good that they saved it. Yes, thank you, Deco Art, for saving black plum. It was on the chopping block. And we whined, and I don't know if they listened to us or was well, my. They listened to somebody. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you, Deco Art. See how that really resonates and becomes very strong. Let's work on the stem while that's drying a little bit. And I'm doing the same thing, but I'm going to go down with a medium. This is light cinnamon. I'm going down with a smaller angle because I have a smaller area. And I'm just going to take my brush and kind of tuck it in there and down in there and pull it up. Gwen asked, what is the best way to choose shading colors? And Jen also asked that earlier. That might be a good technique live. In that the might be, yeah. But what is the best way? The best way is to get your color wheel out. <laughs> no, I, I usually go, I have my favorites. And I think, I really think that many painters have been painting for so long, they don't trust their instinct. 
they just kind of go with whatever color the pattern says. However, I do believe if you can pick an outfit out in your wardrobe and put colors together, what accents what, I think you really have a good eye towards picking out shading colors. And that probably doesn't say anything much, but I think you really need to trust your instincts and to, and I'm, I'm going to do something here that's going to be a little surprising, but I love doing it. Um, usually the rule of thumb is a shade darker, a shade lighter for shading and highlighting, but also sometimes just popping in something unusual and see what happens. Have you ever dropped your brush and that rolled across and you're going, ah, and then you look and you go, oh, you know what? That doesn't look too bad. So play around. I'm just grabbing my little script liner and I'm adding a little bit of striated lines on there. And I wanted to put eyes in. Do we have time to do eyes, Lindsay? Okay, let's go back. Before I put the eyes in, I want to put a little bit of highlight on the pumpkin. And I can take and dry brush highlights on there. I've got my stencil brush. I can use that to put a little bit of highlight on there. I love dry brushing. It's like, is it going to do anything? Is it going to do anything? And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, there it is. You see it starting to evolve. And maybe a little bit down here. Highlight. Boom, boom, boom. And you're using your number three stencil brush. Number three stencil brush. Not this, just for stenciling. That's right. <laughs> These are soft bristles, so I've used them to base coat with. I use them to dry brush with. I use them to stencil with. It's just a really handy brush. Okay, so we want to put eyes on here. Maybe like there and there. And that's how I do my eyes. I pick a spot. And mark it with a dot. And I want to make sure they're perfect. I'm going to use my painter's pal because that makes them perfect every time. I just center the dot in the middle of the stencil. Rosemary says, do you always use a stencil brush for dry shading? No, not always. Um, sometimes I use... Let me grab it here. I like using my number five radical round and I'll just get a little paint on that and I can just swatch it down. You see the highlight and enhances it. Whatever you use for your highlights, dry brushing, patience because it just, it's like magic. My dad was a photographer and I would help him in his studio and you would take the white paper and after it was developed or after he printed on it and you dip it into the chemicals and it was just like, it starts to come, it starts to come and you see that picture just start to evolve. And I always think of him every time I do dry brushing because it's just like, oh, there, I see it. It's starting to happen. And probably, I'll do this now. I was going to do it later, but since you asked, just going to get a little bit of white. And I can just pull that down. And just that little bit really starts to brighten it up. Just going to get a little bit of that. I can stick his nose on there. And what color are you using for this, Anne? Well, I used red spice, but I had a little bit green on my 
stencil brush, so I wiped it off and put a little bit of black plum in there to counteract the green green. So it's, I wanted it darker <laughs> than the background. Now to do the eyes, I think they're dry enough now. I'm going back with my smaller angle and I'm going to pick up some This is celery shoot. And now my brush is wet, so when I roll it over my finger, I see moisture, but it's not dripping. I usually dip my brush in water and then just lay it on a paper towel to reduce a lot of that moisture. Isn't the eighth inch or the quarter? This is a quarter inch awesome angle. And my angles are a little bit, I had them made I like longer, smoother strokes, so I made sure that the bristles were longer so I could get more stroke out of there. Want to, ideally, I would have put two coats on the stenciled eye, but I'm going to brighten up that bottom edge, and I'm blending it up into the eye. You see, I'm kind of tapping it in there to get that color on there. Now that it's tapped in, or now that I have that edge on there, I'm just tapping and blending to soften that so that it's sharp around the outer edge, blended toward the center. But if it's not perfect around the outer edge, that's okay because I'm going to go back, probably with this antique maroon. And I'm just going to outline the eyes with a little bit of shading. Just to really make them stand out and look like they're more carved. Now you notice I've only loaded my brush one time. I can do both eyes because my paint is very fluid. And I can move it around the entire eye and I'm blending it out softly. I can go back, this one's a little choppy, it's still wet. I can go back and smooth it out. I don't have to worry about perfection, especially for this. Get a little more paint on there. I still have the same rush load. Get a little more water on there. So I can, I'm going to pick up just a little more to go around the nose. Darken that down. So I went completely around the eyes and I had to pick up just a tiny bit more on the nose. I'm going to pick up a little bit of marigold. I want this to kind of look a little dimensional, soften that in there. A little bit of highlight in the nose. I want his eyes to not be pale green. So I'm picking up some plantation pine. I want to really green up those eyes. And I'm blending it into that celery shoot. Celery shoot was on the bottom right and this is on the top left look how those really start to go in there a little bit of that marigold we want just a highlight right it's going to look like the side edge of the where his nose is cut out Eyeballs, and I want those dark. I'm going to go into Black Plum. I didn't bring anything darker. That's okay. There's, well, that's not going to work. That's okay. Black. I'm going to use, um, raw, I have raw umber for my stem, so I'm going to grab a little bit of that and Black Plum. I'm not real fussy on colors. If I know I want a dark color, I'll just look at what's on my palette. Stick an eyeball in there, 
And what's nice about these stencils, they're translucent, so I can see where my placement is. And I'm gonna wipe it off so I can match it up on this side. Oops, let's go to that one. Okay. And we'll just let those dry just a bit. And I think I want to just do one more coat on those. I like my pupils to be really dark. If you wipe your stencil off as soon as you use it, you don't have much of a cleanup. That's you can be like us and just leave layers of paint. <laughs> yeah, it's easy to say, right? I think I'm going to grab my eighth inch angle and put just a little more shading inside the nose. Right there. You see what a difference that makes. This is that black plum. Now his nose looks like it's really going down in there. There's a little bit of white on my palette here. I'm going to grab just a little bit of snow white with my eighth inch angle. Just going to brighten up the bottom of his eye. And then I'm going to grab some aqua sky. I love using unexpected color in places. And Aqua Sky is a color that's just really going to create a pop. And it may, will make his eyes glow. Look at that. Oh, but wait until you see what we do. Okay. But wait. But there's hey, more. there's more. <laughs> Grab a little more white. I think aqua sky is like one of your new favorite colors. It is. It was just like all of a sudden I found it. And it was, it was an accident. I was not planning to use aqua sky, but it was on my palette and I needed something. And I thought, you know, I wonder if. And it was like, oh, yeah, that works well. I've got my stylus and I want to put just a little tiny comma stroke. So I dip, dot and drag it up and gosh, it makes the most perfect little comma stroke you ever saw. And I'm gonna let that dry. Let's go back up to the stem, picking up some of that raw umber and right here where it transitions up into the stem, I can really start to make that stem. Not only am I shading on the flat of my brush, I'm using the toe to pull it up and create that shading on the outside edge. I use the toe as a liner and the flat of the brush as a shader. Brushes are so incredibly versatile. If you really work with them, see how I can create that tiny line? I can create striations by staying on the chisel edge. The underneath, I need it to be stronger so I can just really work that in. Down here on this little tip, I'm just going to jump over to my Epic Script Liner. And I'm just going to really enhance that with just a liner. Okay, because I did all of this with my angle brush except that little bit, because I added that little tiny detail there, it makes it all look like there's tiny detail. I love it, absolutely love it. Such a fun way. Let's go ahead while we're there and add some highlights. And I'm going to use my uh, um, Epic Script Liner to add some highlights. Again, you need to have enough moisture on the brush. If you have a shaky hand, You'll do really well at this because I don't like my highlights to be perfect. 
I want to put a little bit on there. Look at that. Just a little bit of paint. What a huge difference it makes. That's it. I mean, look at that. That is amazing. That little stem stands out. It looks great. Oh, but yeah, we're going to do something else. It's just really going to make a difference. That might be a little too bright, so I'm just going to finger mop it. Just touch it with my finger. Okay, let's go back to the eye. It looks good, but I'm taking some of that black plum on the toe of my quarter inch angle. I'm going to pull a shade across the top of the eye and look what a difference that makes. This is a simple, just a float shade right there. Wow, what a difference. But when I go in and add, let's just do a bigger one. Whoa. Look at those eyes, man. He's really looking at you. Because I've added some white up here and here, I need to add a little bit of white on the mouth or on the nose. I'm just going to. Add just a little bit on the nose, maybe right there too. Not too much. If you get too much, then it starts to detract. And I thought it'd be fun to do the mouth. I was going to do the little barbed wire, but it's just a real simple line with X's on it and a little bit of shading below. So I'm going to go ahead and I can't, I'm anxious to show you the little wow factor. All right, he's looking pretty cute and pretty cool. Should we do the mouth, Lindsay? Yeah, you got time. Okay. I hate to not. This is a really fun way to do a mouth. And I'll just let him dry a little bit. This is a speak no evil pumpkin. Yeah. What is that show? The one where the the mouth is stitched shut. Uh, yeah, it's me too fast. The Halloween show. Um, where the kids hocus pocus. No, not hocus pocus. No, Halloweenville. Wait, I think hocus pocus isn't. I don't know. I think the one that comes out of the grave has it, doesn't he? Some uh, yeah, somebody. They're, they all run together. <laughs> I like putting little eyebrows on. It makes him look a little bit perplexed. And if you've not tried my Epic Script Liner, it's a little bit longer. It's 18 knot, a little bit longer than a liner, shorter than a script, great control, perfect little lines every time. Okay, we'll let this dry. That look, took like two seconds on that. He looks perplexed because he wants to know why his mouth's wired shut. Yeah, <laughs> maybe I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> Let's put a little bit of shading right there below. And that's just a quick float. No big deal. Rosemarie wants to know how you did the background. Oh, I can show you that. Yes, I think I can. Do you need another? Mm. Oh, well, maybe I can show them on here. We can do that. Okay. Let me put a little bit of highlight on his mouth. Oh, Gwen said it is Hocus Pocus. He comes out of the grave. Oh, thank See, you. I, I was Trivia for today. Yes. Lindsay knows all that stuff. Thanks, Gwen. <laughs> That's the stuff you remember at 2 in the morning. Just that easy. Just that little bit of highlight makes it a little. And one thing I wanted to do, too, and I didn't do, I'm going to grab real quick. I like to put a little bit of a float under the eyebrows. Just adds dimension, adds dimension, shading and highlight. Absolutely wonderful. All right, so he doesn't look bad. I think he's real good. I'm gonna grab some Aqua Sky and I have this really thinned down because a little bit of paint makes a big difference. 
Now just put a little bit right there. It's like the moon shining on it. Oh my gosh, this is so cool. Blue for a shadow. Or a highlight, right? Or is that a shadow? This is in the shadow part. Oh. So let's put a little bit here. See, that's where I get confused. To me, that glows, so I would think it would be a highlight, but it's in the shadow. It's See, a, that's yeah. where I get confused. <laughs> but I'm semi-pro, so. <laughs> <laughs> Just enhancing that shadow. It looks a little bright. It's going to dry a little bit quieter. But I don't want it to be all alone. So I'm going to pick up a little bit on my quarter inch angle and put just a teeny bit right in there. Here and there. This is kind of a tap float because I don't want it real strong. It's very thin paint. I don't want it real solid. So I'm just kind of hitting it and tapping it out. Um, I think especially with this style, the fact that it's Halloween, it needs to be a little bit eerie and whimsical. Put just a little bit down here. This is kind of a little bit of moon glow bouncing up. But look at that. I mean, it's just like it glows right now. I can go back and add some stronger highlights. I think maybe a little bit of shading around here. It's just a little bit. This is my tap float. Just to kind of pull it out. And then I still have that movement. I just have a little bit of paint. A little bit of paint makes such a big difference. Let those brushes really work for you. You can move mountains with those little brushes. I'm thinking that maybe even right here in the eye, just a little bit right Oh, look at that. So much fun. I just love to play around with color. This is where I fuss the most, just making sure a little bit of hint here and there. I could probably pop a little bit in his nose. Just a touch. Okay, so shading and highlighting, you need to have good brushes the right amount of moisture in your brush to transport the paint. Know your area, your open time. Use um, helpers if you need to, a, a mister, a glazing medium. Use what you need to make it work for your area. Um, you need to have your brush loaded correctly. And then look at your hands while you paint to make sure that you're holding your brush correctly and pulling it across correctly. Be fearless, work quickly, but not messy. Make sure that you have good control of your brush. I use thin paint many layers because to me, that gives me the ability to build up layers. Here's this little guy next to it. Um, Actually, like I said, I've been on a pumpkin roll, so. You're on a pumpkin person. roll. <laughs> uh, sorry, guys. <laughs> but look at how different all these pumpkins are. They're all the same, but they're all different. Little bit of paint makes a big difference. So pay attention to how you're holding your brush and then play wet, play around with the different types of shading. They don't all have to be smooth and perfect. 
they can be bouncy and have a lot of vibrance and movement in the background. They don't have to be all the same, at least not for my style of painting. There's some applications where, you know, that is required, no doubt. But even this little spider, he has a lot going on with this little guy. And honestly, to, to pop him in there, it didn't take long at all. Did you talk about the background? The not background? yet. Okay. okay, background. And I don't know if I can show it. This is uh, watercolor paper, but I'm thinking that it won't grab too much. On the background, I just took a little bit, a little bit of antique maroon. And this was, um, I think the, I had used a, a board that was base coated like buttermilk or a light color. Using the oval wash, I love this brush because it covers large areas quickly. I have a lot of moisture in my brush and this I do work very quickly. So I just do slip slap and I go over and over and it's grabbing in. So I'm gonna have that stop and start mark Crisscross, back and forth, crisscross, quickly. That little thing of paint. Because I'm working with this paper, it's soaking in very quickly. I love the movement in the background. I can go back and add a different color. And kind of add a little more movement in there. The the trick on this is getting it on there without ending up with spots. It might work better if I do it on this this one. I don't know how well that's going to show up. What's on the back of that? Black. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to work on that. Okay, we're doing okay on this. You see how it flows together. This is much better. And I do that crisscross, blend it back and forth. You can see that motion in there. I can go back with a little darker color, add that in there. You know, it kind of reminds me of that background, reminds me of old, um, like in school, the portrait backgrounds. Yes, I, I brushstroke background. Yeah. And then usually what I do after I do a background like this, and I can go over it until it starts to tack up. Then you walk away. Two layers always works best. But I can go back. We have a lot going on in this. I should do a thing on backgrounds. If you guys have suggestions on what you would like, I think Lindsay posted a thing on Facebook today, what you would like um, to touch on. Just... We are looking for suggestions on technique videos that Chris can do, or I should say lives, right? Yes. And you can see this second layer I'm putting on, how much more pigmented it becomes. It's kind of weird with that red or with that, those stripes in there. But they become very obscure starting to lift because I've not let that dry. That's when you stop. Go back with a little more of this black plum. See if we can mute those. Thin layers of paint, no matter whether you're shading, uh, doing a background, thin layers of paint are always going to be the best result. I'm going to pick up a little bit of that antique maroon, blend those two together. Play around, see what happens. I don't know what's on the back of it, I can't do that either. 
This would be one I'm going to start over because of all that stroke work in the background. Let me go back to this one and see if we can. Usually if I'm working on watercolor paper, I'll seal it first with um, that multi-purpose sealer. Allows the paint to scoot across the top of it and not grab in. There we go. It's still going to grab. But you can see the light and dark. I like that movement. And if I put several coats on it, you'll get a, it becomes a very interesting background. I can blend colors together. Darker over here, a little bit lighter over there. Blend it out. It, it just becomes, to me, that's starting to look very moody. I just wondered what would happen. I may regret this. Pick up a little bit of that aqua sky. Little bit of paint. Well, I don't know. Rosemary said thank you. She likes that type of background. It is. It's just a fun, to me, it's, it's very delightful. It's just fun and easy. You can splash in different colors. It, I should have used on this, I should have done um, the yellows and oranges. It wouldn't have looked so hideous. Yeah. You see how quickly you can fill that in. I'm gonna blend that down there. Okay, so that's not so much a favorite here. But you can get, I did the same thing with this. I started out with antique maroon. I did a little bit of black plum and then I went back and shaded a little bit with that aqua sky. Aqua sky just here and there. That's my unexpected color, really creates a pal. So hopefully, You've picked up a few tips and tricks to make your shading and highlighting a little bit easier. Probably my biggest suggestion is to don't fuss and have fun. Look at what you're doing and watch how you're painting to see if you're stiff and loose. Let it flow. Let yourself relax. If it's not flowing, you need more water. Um, if you're, you're, Paint is short strokes, you need more paint, more water. You want nice, long, fluid strokes. Don't be afraid to go to a bigger brush, even in smaller areas. As long as you have good control, it's gonna work out really well. There's nothing that you can do that can't be fixed. And I forget who told me, was that Jen the other day, Lindsay? It said, I think it's, it, I don't think it's gonna work. Been, yeah. yeah, and I said, oh, no, no, no. I said, keep going with it. And she's like, oh, my gosh, this is great. So shading and highlighting, that's just like icing on the cake. Once you get the base coating done, to me, that's when the ride begins and everything starts to look absolutely fantastic. Practice, practice, practice. And that's from Priscilla, not me. <laughs> but that is the key. So kind of practice or keep these tips in mind as you practice. And I think you'll be surprised at what a difference it'll make and how things look. So good mindset. Yes. Uh, a couple of things before we go. It okay. Like you're winding up. Yes. Maybe. Oh, Christmas unwrapped. Yep. Okay. I should let Lindsay take this over because she was integral on this whole program, the setup and the ideas behind it, it's, her and Jen. It's just a couple more days that you can get this at the introductory price of $99.95. So March 1st, the price goes up to $119.99, wait, $119.95. Um, and what you get, you get five ornaments. You get a Chris Hoy pattern on all five of those ornaments. Which is amazing. Um, you also get a semi-pro pattern done by Jen this month. Um, some goodies, some bonuses, you know, all in one box. There's four boxes sent out, and it really, really, really is a fantastic deal. Um, $99.95 until March 1st. So sign up now to get the savings. I think the first shipment goes out March 15th. Yes, for it, domestic. 
Okay, for yeah. domestic. If yeah. you're international, we try to save you money and we send two at a time. So. Yeah, you don't want to miss out on this. This is really a fun, a fun program that, that we put a lot of time and energy in. And I know you're going to be thrilled with every shipment. And the last thing. Oh, yeah. Guess what? Shipping. We have the new deco art colors. They're going out. And again, I'll let Lindsay take over because she handles all of this. <laughs> so we are beginning to ship the new deco art colors. Um, if you did pre-order, um, we are shipping in the order in which they received. You should, everyone should have them. I would say by the end of next week, we do have a tremendous amount of orders to work through. So, um, so bear with us while we work through them. Um, and then they're also available to order on our website if you did not get those yet. So again, these eight fantastic pretty colors are now available yeah. in our shipping. There's going to be some new patterns with these colors in it. I can guarantee you that because they are gorgeous. No, I think everybody needs one bottle of each at least. <laughs> so, okay. okay, is that it? That's it for me. Okay, I think that's it for me. Don't forget next Tuesday, the baking day. Um, is going to be available. It's a full, complete tutorial on how to paint the uh, project. The pattern and the surface is available now on our website. So when you order your paint and you order your Christmas unwrapped, you can pick that up as well and save on shipping. So I think that's about it. Remember, pay attention to your floating and shading, highlighting. It's going to look fantastic practice and remember a little bit of paint makes a big difference so thank you for joining us today no oh, question. Lindsay's got one. Uh, Margaret wants to know if the new colors are on the, in the new box they're not because she did not have them yet so the first box will not feature the new decor no, colors no. the second box oh might definitely yes yeah. yes so um Oh, Nancy said she would like to see more on the color wheel. Oh, yeah. Did you see that little thing I put on Facebook last night? When I was doing these little guys, um, the Halloween book stack ornaments, I knew I wanted something different in the background, and I was, I don't know. I just wasn't being very creative. When I'm not very feeling very creative, I go to my color wheel, and I, I knew I wanted analogous colors and I just looked at that and I thought it was so easy. It was like, oh yeah, I'll do this and this. And then all I had to do was find the deco art paint that matched it and I was good to go. So color wheel is, is an amazing tool that can be very, very helpful. Okay. That's it. We'll have to do something on that. Yeah, I've got a list here. Okay, practice, practice, practice. Remember a little bit of paint makes a big difference. Thank you for joining us today and look forward to our next painting adventure too.